just come back from a gig. I should have been home, no doubt. But I jumped up on the microphone and started singing with a DJ who was there. And he told me that it would, might be a good idea to join him um, the, week, the, the next week in his studio to write some music. And over the next couple of weeks, three weeks, me, Dave and Johnny were in the studio and we wrote a few songs, got signed to a record deal and Don't Hold Back went number one on the dance charts for 27 weeks. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy. With yours truly, Michael Kahan. Hello, hello, hello. Wow. What can I say about Ilan and this chat? He has a magical outlook on life, grounded in reality and able to dance in the unknown. He's a poet with a philosopher's mind who's really funny. This chat is simply unreal. I don't have the words to describe it. I met Ilan at a wedding and he told me an aspect of his story, which is simply mind-blowing, which we dive into. Ilan will also be performing at my wedding later in the year, which I'm stoked about. Just a heads up, we do dive into topics about suicide and death. If you or someone you know is experiencing any crisis, please reach out to your medical professional. If you're listening from Australia, you can contact Lifeline. Okay, so let's get into it. Ilan Kidron is an award-winning singer-songwriter. He's perhaps best known for his role as the frontman for the multi-platinum, multi-apra-winning electric group, The Potbellies. Behind the scenes, Ilan has evolved into one of Australia's most successful and in-demand songwriters. With The Potbellies, Ilan has enjoyed a golden run of hits in Australia and has also tasted chart and radio success throughout Europe. He co pen anthems Don't Hold Back, Are You With Me, and From The Music, some of your favourites, which have featured prominently across major advertising and television campaigns, which you've probably seen and heard. Ilan is not only a versatile entertainer, but also an in-demand co-writer and producer. As a songwriter, he has over 1 billion combined streams and Billboard number ones, having written for Rita Ora, Ricky Martin, Jessica Malboy, Chance the Rapper, Chris Brown, Tina Arena, Sesame Street, Timmy Trumpet, Kygo, Hayden James, Ricky Lee Coulter, Eurovision, and many others. He also fronts the band Glassbreakers, which have become a tight, energetic powerhouse of party brilliance, performing breathtaking new takes on old world classics and wicked twists. They're the perfect wedding and corporate event band to keep your guests entertained from start to finish. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, and we chat about flow, Grief and Death, Music, The Potbellies, Joy and Passion, Challenges with Touring, Collaboration, Ego, Right and Wrong, Going Solo, Mental Health, plus plenty more. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure. So check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5pm Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway... Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. I've got a quote of yours. Let's see where we go with this. <laughs> We've missed planes, caught helicopters, emptied bars, toured in some really dangerous countries, held at gunpoint, and been thrown out of airports. I mean, we really did it all. I'd love to know which is your, what springs to mind as the most memorable experience from that. Well, I imagine that would have been uh, one of our adventures with the pop bellies. Early on, the two DJs in the band toured on this, uh, I think it was a Jim Bean tour or something gratuitous yeah. like that. And they did the Eastern Bloc. They went to Romania. They, went, they ended up going to China as well. But I think in Romania was where they were held at gunpoint in a nightclub 
Wow. And uh, and told to um, told to keep playing or else or something. You know? <laughs> but for myself, I mean, there's been obviously you're on the road. People are. People around you often are very uh, either inebriated or relaxed or just they feel pretty free. Yeah. And um, you get lots of things, lots of funny things happen. Uh, one thing that springs to mind, we were doing this little show. It was like a jazz gig up the top floor of the casino in Sydney called the Astral Bar. Yeah. And it's the sort of place where no one goes. <laughs> it, it's it's really where you might take someone you're having an affair with, or uh, <laughs> some Korean tourists might end up there. Or um, yeah. you know. so the bar had like twelve people in it that night. This is years and years and years ago, and all of a sudden, this um, seventy to eighty year old short, thin Chinese man walks in, smoking a cigarette, wearing. Not so smart clothes. We were in a in a casino, and obviously everyone at the casino try, kind of dresses up. Dresses yeah. up. This guy was not dressed up, but it was very clear from the way he rolled in with his entourage that he was a billionaire of some sort. And he sat down, listened to two minutes of the music, and started going like this to me. Which, for those who can't see, he started, um, you know, putting a knife to his neck, looking at me, and saying, "You stop! You stop!" Um, now, the only way this story actually works is if I do do it in a Chinese accent. <laughs> yeah, that's <what> I mean. <laughs> But uh, you've got to excuse me. But, it, um, but uh, he, he ordered us to stop playing. And at one point I said, look, if you want us to stop playing, you have to pay us to stop playing. So he gave each of us $500 no. to stop playing, <laughs> jumped on the mic and started screaming, China number one, China number one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and, and you finish, you finish, you finish was what he was saying. So whenever anyone did a bad solo in the band from that day on, it was you finish, you finish. <laughs> but lots of, there's, there's lots of stories. I mean, you go up to the Gold Coast and it's one big um, women on rosé playground uh, where really anything can happen. Um, mm. Yeah, 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 good times. There's so much that springs to mind, but you would have never thought that situation would happen with the Chinese man. Keep paying you not to play. Was that? A, did you hurt the ego? Or is this a great story? No, no, it was a great to, story. Yeah. I've, I think I've told the story ten times for sure. So, no, look, you, you, um, you roll with punches. It wasn't. We weren't offended. Yeah, there was something definitely lost in translation, but you know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Did, did he ever find out uh, what his issue was or he just wanted Nothing. to... Nothing. It was best left um, uninvestigated. Yeah. But it's also the chutzpah of you guys to ask for money to stop. I love that. You could have been like, okay, let's get the fuck out of here. But no, you, you got you got something. Well, yeah, I figured, I figured we'd try and get something out of it. <laughs> what would you... <laughs> were you nervous doing something like that, if you remember? Cause... I don't know. I'm not that kind of guy. I just, I'm a very um, outgoing kind of guy in that sort of situation i'd probably had a drink or two as well with the rest of the guys and um no no i mean i'm i'm one to occasionally put my foot in it i guess um but that was not a a time to be too sensitive i just felt it it felt right yeah yeah i love it and i love the uh the cheeky smile you mentioned that you kind of like go with the flow i would imagine like when you're performing or all types of things would happen, whether electricity goes out or maybe the music's not working or the guitar's broken. And I would imagine that you're just able to kind of... Well, I mean, here's another story for you. We, um, this is a classic. We, we would do lots and lots of sports programs. I guess, you know, grand finals would go out and play, you know, for the soccer grand final, the AFL grand final, rugby league grand final, I think we did. It was the sort of music the Pop Bellies were doing, which, was, uh, which crossed over from the pub into the club very easily. I mean, and then onto TV later on, whatever. But so we would get asked to do a lot of sports programming stuff. Now you're from Melbourne, so you would know that the weekend before the AFL or the night before the AFL grand final, there's a big talk back um, show live on TV where they get all the stars there. Oh, the footy it's, like, show. it's the footy show and it's the yeah. grand final footy show. And they often do it live at Rod Laver Arena. Yeah. Um, and so we were asked to do it to be the kind of um, interval um, nice. um, entertainment <clears throat> um, and started, uh, the, the music started, bam, 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 big song is called Hello. Yep. And the whole place is going nuts. 
It's going live to air as well all over Australia. I don't know how many people watch it. Two million. There, mil- there were millions at probably yeah. that time. So yeah. I start singing, belting, belting, and everyone's having a great time. And then all of a sudden, I sense the energy in the whole stadium change. And I kept going. I've got in ears, so I can't really hear what's happening. I've got in ear monitors. So these are monitors that go direct into my ears, just like you're listening to a, uh, an iPhone. With your, yeah. uh, well, I'm listening to the music, and you can get a really good mix. It's a professional mix, in ear monitors. Anyway, oh, nice. there I am singing, not knowing what's going on, but I sense something has changed. I look around to the band, and they're going, oh, oh no. And I just kept going. Now, mm-hmm. after the performance, I found out that the sound in the whole arena went off, completely oh. off. And, <laughs> and I was singing on my own, on my own, solo these songs, and everyone was like, that. And then, of course, the music came back on at one point and everyone cheered and went crazy. Later on, I found out that it went to air on TV just fine, just fine. Oh, nice. No glitch. But in the whole place, there was no sound to whatever, 18,000 people or whatever. I don't know how many it fits. But um, there I was singing on my own. Wow. And It so, does go wrong, but, you know, you just carry on. But a lot of people, you know, we've had plenty of stand-up. Sometimes when something like that happens, it's very hard to recover. I would imagine a lot of these things have happened. And you, it doesn't seem to phase you from what I'm aware of. Like, has there ever been a time where you're like, whatever, this is it, let's have you, go. Have you seen, you've seen, um, I think it's Pulp Fiction, where Harvey Keitel plays the cleaner? Remind me. Well, Harvey Keitel, you know Harvey Keitel is? Anyway, he, he, he plays this character. He turns up in a very, very nice suit and he cleans up the mess. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Yep, yep. I'm pretty sure it's Pulp Fiction. Anyway, when, when shit hits the fan live... I'm the cleaner. So oh. I just do it with a calm head and just carry on and get the audience singing along. They don't even know what's happened. So it's a peculiar set of skills, Michael. <laughs> but I would imagine you have to develop that. Is that or you've always, since you picked up and sang, you just... From when I remember, I was always saving the party or whatever. You, know? <laughs> can you, you mentioned the word um, like you can sense the crowd. It's pretty hard to sense 18,000 in an arena and you've you performed to tens of thousands, less than tens of thousands. What is that? Is that just being so into the music that you fill your space around you or is that something within yourself? How do you explain it? I think it's, it's just as physical <clears throat> as it is mental and whatever else. I'm not sure where the, where the spirit starts or what the spirit is, but it's when those two come together, the body and the mind, I think that the spirit is allowed to dance and playing music or writing music um, and being in an exchange of some sort with other musicians and then with the crowd itself just feeds. It feeds something that is like a feedback loop and and it can, um, they dance together. And I love that. I love seeing people's reactions. Yeah. Having said that, I much prefer doing the shows where I'm not, in it for the audience and the writing part as well where i'm in it for 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 my spirit and sharing the reality of it and i think the audience really respects that that sure you're you're here to share yeah you're i'm sharing me you yeah know, with you're being you yeah you're being genuine and respectful to what your vision is to the show and what the music is all about as soon as you start um you know, Rick Rubin is one of my heroes and he says something along the lines, as soon as you start wanting to serve the listener, um, I think you, you're off track to something that is truly spiritual and truly awakening within you, which is why we're doing it. Oh, okay. Because, you know, you hear a lot of people where it's always, it's all about the audience. And through my perspective as a screenwriter, I know they're not quite the same, but it's still a creative um, endeavour. If I'm writing 100% for someone else, then I'm not putting me in. I'm not being authentic to my vision and I don't get that feeling that you're kind of talking about. Yes, I need to be aware of the audience, but when it becomes 100% not about them, I feel like I can't do what I need to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. It's interesting. It's, it's a different perspective. Yeah. Especially when I'm writing a song, if I start to, to think, oh, is that the point I want everyone to dance or is that the point where I want it to light up? It immediately derails what I'm looking for because yeah. actually the, the, my, my whole philosophy is not to try and go to where I need to be going. It's to allow it to come to you. Okay. So I'm writing a song. It's just, it might seem a little 
odd, but yeah, it's like if you're open and you're not trying too hard, that's when the beauty, that's when everything can enter. And it's the same live. Like, of course, you get to learn the hits and you get to learn tricks and you get to, you know, of course, I'm asking the audience to sing along and to go, to go with me. But there's something terribly ego-driven about it where it's about, it's my story, you know, and we're sharing it. And my hope is that you share my story within your own. Oh, so like everyone's like perspective, they hear what you've got and then they can like dance with it in their own way. They're, they're doing it. It's not even a reaction to, it's just they're, they're living their own life through the music as, as they're hearing it. I mean, surely you know a song that you've heard. I mean, I've got hundreds um, that I listen to and I relate it back immediately to me. It's just um, my heart just bursts and I'm an easy crier. So there's, there's just so much music that makes me do that. Oh, okay. You've got a brilliant perspective on this. How do you describe, how do you get your ideas? Do you close your eyes and it comes? Do you, I feel like you're channeling the music in your own way. Well, like right near, right now we could immediately start writing a song called The Channel because you just said channeling ideas and everything like that. So The Channel is a cool name for a song and it'd be about, you know, opening your eyes to, to something. But, but then you can always pivot. You've got to be early on in the songwriting process, you need to be able to, to pivot really quickly. So opening your eyes to something might, um, might change pretty quickly to opening the door. And then all of a sudden you're opening a door to what? To a house. And, and the, house, the door of the house is opening and what do you see in the house? Bang, bang, yeah. What do you see in that? So you need to just be able to flow. And the way I like to do the early, like the, the early um, chapter of songwriting when I'm starting to write a song, especially if I'm writing with someone else, everything gets written down and everything gets put on this little baby here, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, so we've got a voice recorder going and I just keep it on. So many wonderful ideas are lost because our memories are shocking or we're just distracted by all those ideas. That, yeah. It's also practice, I think. And also my sense of creativity, I think, has changed. Um, and the on. way I work has changed from being very fluid and very um, open and fast and being able to write things very quickly, although that does still happen. Um, I could still write a song. It's not unheard of in, 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 in now to write a song in 45 minutes, but it's more likely to be crafted over a long period of time, more yeah. of a, of a crystallised sense of creativity than a fluid type of creativity now. I am um, not to compare because I know they're different and uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say this, but one of the scripts that I wrote, sometimes it can take weeks or months or whatever. I wrote it in one day from meditation and 90% of it was formed, but then like a year or two of it was like crafting along the way. But that just because I was open and I was just in a space where I could like kind of see it or feel it and just jot everything down. So it's a very interesting like it just feels like you've got this openness to receive what you, you get something and you're able to play with it and dance with it and not be so rigid because from a writing perspective, when we're rigid, it's never going to work out. You get writer's block. If you even think of it like that. No. Yeah. I, I think that uh, as you were saying that I'm thinking, wow, that sort of carries on through with the, with my life as well with my relationships with people too. I can be very flowy with it and open and, and, um, and sometimes I think that, and the intentions are all fantastic because I want to, I want to dance with everyone. You know, I want everyone to, to have a good time around me uh, or I want everyone to go on a journey uh, with me. But sometimes, you know, it, it, it doesn't always work for the best. You know, sometimes yeah. as you, as you say, I mean, sometimes we fail at that and, and yeah, I guess, and, and that's where other skills come in. Oh, can you, you talk know, to that, that? that? Well, I think you just mentioned, I think you mentioned meditation or I think mm. you mentioned being able to breathe through, um, breathe through pain or breathe through whatever it is you, you need to breathe through. Um, I, Spent many years on the road um, at the detriment to my family, you know, um, 
when you're away for three weeks at a time, when you have a young child and you're busy being in the spaceship um, and it's awesome fun and you're being able to be creative, you're in your hotel rooms and you're writing and you're meeting lots of people and you're, um, you're partying a bit and you're stuck with this, with this new family, this family of boys who are crazy Irish boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you come back home and the flow that you had on the road is not the flow that you have back home at all. And it takes a lot of, um, practice getting that right and sometimes you, you can't get that right you know that's the hardest part of touring is not the air the flying it's not the setting up it's not the performance actually often and it's very common for for touring musicians it's coming back home and being able to accept that things run without you there as well interesting i would also yeah. imagine the adrenaline the fun like you're immersed in this world and then you're going into a different world and that can kind of feel like a completely different reality as well. Yeah, especially in your late twenties. You yeah, know, where, where the airplane's just taking off, and you can tilt the airplane in any direction. It just even a, a slight angle, two degrees angle, the airplane will end up thousands of miles away from where it was already heading. So you know, when you're young like that, you tend to take more risks. I, you mentioned the word detrimental, and I know that there's a whole and we'll. We'll get into it as deep as you want, a whole journey there, to say the least. But is, there, is it the right word detriment, detrimental? Because you're still, like, being you, you're still giving love in your way to your family. You're I still... Think, well, certainly, it, 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 was de it feels detrimental at the time when you're in grief, when you're in the throes of confusion and... Um, and well, let me explain. I, I, I don't know. I'm not doing like a gotcha. I was very interested no, in that word. Yeah. No, no. I'm, um, I'm comfortable speaking about my life and that's why I came on here. And, um, you know, and I guess th that, that's the, the, the whole um, direction that you've taken your podcast in is so people can, can relate and to be able to um, mm. try and understand how people deal with the big throes of life, the big things that, that, that we are up against. Um, so my family moved to Los Angeles um, on the back of me having a bit of success as a writer, a songwriter. And we very quickly got um, embedded in LA life, I guess, working, dining, partying. Um, and we bought a house real quick as well. Um, and, and in the valley, and we had bills to pay and a mortgage, and as a result, I had to tour. So I was, I, I left Sam, my, my wife, and, and my child, Gabe, in Los Angeles uh, while I toured for three weeks at a time. Or I, I think there was one year there where I did 18 return trips to Sydney from LA. It was just it, to be able to kind of pay the bills but also keep, you know, everything going. Now, as a result, the writing suffered because I wasn't on the ground in LA a lot and the whole thing kind of started to unravel a little. Yep. And one trip back in, in I think I was in, uh, in Tasmania at the time teaching at a school, doing a, I would do these songwriting workshops <clears throat> with high schoolers nice. during the week and tour on the weekend. That's crazy. Um, and it was an incredible initiative by APRA, it was called the Songmakers Program, that me and Lior and Katie Noonan and Robert Conley and a bunch of amazing musicians started with Tina Broad over at APRA doing these amazing workshops. Anyway, I had a phone call with Sammy and I noticed that her voice had changed and she was speaking really fast and it, it put me on edge and I called some friends and I told her what I'd just experienced and that in fact it was getting worse because she was as the conversations went on I realized she started to kind of hallucinate and see and imagine things going on and it was kind of became clear and I have I was so inexperienced at this I didn't know what it was it was scary yeah because my child was over there as well because Gabe was over there our child yep. um, and she was having a, a manic breakdown of some sort she was in she was in mania and 
it was school holidays, so we were able to. I flew back with Gabe here to Sydney, uh, and Sammy packed up the house and moved to New York with like ten suitcases and just just went for it. She was, and it was the typical um, typical destructive sense of mania that took over and. I won't go into the details of, of a lot of what happened, but it, it was full on. You know, she was walking through the streets shouting at strangers and it was in New York. It was dangerous. Yeah. So she ended up, um, well, one of the, I guess it's a regret. I regret putting Sammy into um, an institution over there because it was horrific. And if there was any other way at the time, it, it was very complicated because we didn't know what to do. Yeah, of course. But I probably would have managed it differently knowing now what I know about what went down in there and it was a horrible place for her. It was just horrible. It didn't, didn't do anything. It just made her more manic, more crazy. And her cousin then put her into another institution because I became the devil for putting her into that first institution. It's a, it's a big story. Of course. Eventually, eventually. Can, can I just, she, yeah, sorry. Sure. Any, just so no, 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 I really appreciate it. It's, it's very important to note that you're going through something. I have no idea. You love this woman. You're trying the best that you can. You've also got a son. And though, you know, we all have regrets, can't tell you like what to think. In that moment, you're trying your best. And um, it'd be particularly hard when a cousin is saying, you're being the devil when you're just trying to manage through this moment because this is the woman that you love. And you, you don't have the skill set or knowledge. I just wanted to put that. Oh, I wasn't the devil to the cousin. I was the devil to my wife at the time oh, because okay, I put gotcha. her into the institution. And, and a lot of other things. We had a complicated relationship as well. And, and as I said, you know, we were touring a lot and I just wasn't there. It was just a very, very complicated time. We'd been together 21 years or something at that stage oh. since we were kind of university sweethearts. So it was, oh, it was wow. a deep love. It was a big love. Yep. Um, and the most important um, at the time. So, so it was able to get Gabe back to Australia and after a few months, a lot happened, but Sammy started coming down out of the mania and she realised that she wanted to be with her family again and she moved to Australia and back here where, um, where we lived separately but, she, but close by, we're very close, we're talking all the time. And then, you know, one day she, she, she was talking about ending her life a lot and she'd already been in three institutions by then and she really didn't want to go in and we, we just figured we'd be there for each other. And everyone, everyone she had a huge community. She, had, she was working um, at Emmanuel Shaw um, up here. She was working at Flickerfest. She was doing some really great stuff and she was really loved. And, look, most of the time she seemed really positive she was doing everything she could she was exercising she was eating the right food but alas you know one day uh you know i find i found her hanging in her apartment wow. um, she ended her life and she left two boys behind and and you know i felt terribly responsible um so did so many others around us um and it's been six years now something like that um and it's it's exactly i mean it, a friend said to me yesterday and what's beautiful is that we're actually born with grief in us it's not just the potential not just the potential it's that physically there is grief in us there is a sadness there's this you pulled out all of a sudden there's a longing immediately yep. and regardless of the generational trauma that we've all heard about especially as holocaust survivors our grandparents and whatnot there is this physical connection to grief because we the first thing that happens is that we're pulled out of the m most beautiful place we can. So I can't say that this feeling was familiar, man, because it was heavy. Nothing made sense. I mean, there's things that I was. I also said a lot of things to people who then I, you know, that I regret saying as well. Like it was my fault. I shouldn't have done this. I have done to some of her girlfriends, and you know, like. I just came out as it was brutal. It was yeah. brutal in the throes of it. Um, and I, I, I've been in, uh, I've been in therapy since and before that. I love it. Like, nice. As you can, as you can hear, I, I, I'm not object to talking about it. Mm, I think it's wonderful. Um, 
And I've also talked to a lot of other people about it in songwriting processes. So during COVID, one of the ways that I, I helped heal myself and others or just to keep doing the work, you know what I mean? Like it, it, I, it's not so much healing. I don't look at, I don't go out to heal. Yeah. I don't write to heal. I don't exercise to heal. I don't talk to heal. I just do it. Yeah. And it You're a natural this. healer. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. There's something about the word heal that is... Yeah, I know, I know. It can be, some people get the EBGVs. Interesting, yeah. Um, but during COVID, I ran workshops over Zoom for people who'd gone through um, trauma or... And I did songwriting workshops and a couple of the uh, actual songs on Spotify. Oh, that, nice. Uh, that, you know, you can put up if you want to check out... Um, to check out some of the songs that we did, that were powerful songs, fully produced songs by the end of it. And, what are their um, names? And I'll put them in the episode notes. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Dancing in the Mirror was one of them. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll send you a couple of notes. You okay. can send, I'll send you some links. Thanks. Yeah. And, you know, they also by songwriting with, uh, these, this was with people who weren't musicians, by the way. These were just people who, who had been through trauma and yeah, nice. wanted to write a song to deal with the death of their sister um, or dealing with COVID or um, there was one beautiful one I did with, um, with an elderly lady who was just plainly just thinking about what it's going to be like when her husband passes. And that was called One of Us Will Be Left Alone. I mean, they, they were just really deep, beautiful songs. And without realising it, I would walk out of it replenished or, oh. or deeper or more open. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think it is to when you hear something, see something, feel something where they can just, you know, you're going, you're having these deep, deep conversations, huge amount of trauma, and you can walk out of there with a smile on your face. That's brilliant. That is a life skill. That, and you're also making someone else feel good, which is great. What do you think it is? Well, there's something going off in the brain, clearly, first yeah. of all. There's something scientific happen, happening. I'm not a neuroscientist, but Sam Harris would turn around and say, well, there's these <laughs> things parking off and that. And, uh, and that by being, creati- being creative, especially with another person, you're, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you are um, in the process of something quite wonderful but mechanical. I mean, that's why I'll always adhere to kind of Sam Harris's style of meditation um, as opposed to Deepak Chopra's, which is more esoteric and using big words like enter the realm <laughs> of your spirit, things like that, yeah. which I, I just don't connect to. I'm more of, um, when it comes to things like that, I'm more of a mechanical person. So, but the romantic in me <laughs> says <laughs> yeah. that there is something otherworldly happening when you're connecting with music. Um, there is something that you can't control that you need to let yourself go into. And, and sometimes it's just too much for the emotions and you cry or you feel it really deeply. And, um, and it's, and it's where the brain, the mind and the soul kind of interlope together somehow. And, and they're married in this kind of crazy realm that I can't explain. <laughs> it's so brilliant because I'm no musician, but when I hear a song and it has to be at a certain loudness, it can't be too soft. I feel the hairs on my, I feel I'm hyper aware of my body and it feels like bliss. I'm not even producing the music. And this is coming from someone that is not on the, is no musician, doesn't play. Any, I used to when I was younger, but, and I just get this feeling of like, it's just like, it feels to be alive. And you know, I used to be an accountant and I brought this up heaps of times and I would have never have had that feeling of like aliveness and how sometimes a good song or the beat of a song can really transform you and get you out of whatever you're feeling. Even if you just had a bad day or you're hungry, sometimes a good song can transform you, if we will use your words, um, into a different realm. <laughs> I'm just but yeah, 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 it feels quite, quite, quite magical. They say yes. that, um, that, that when you're making art as in as in visual art yeah. that you're playing with space and then they say with sound when you're playing when you're making music you're playing with time and and so there's there is that 
idea of your playing, whether it's whether it's playing some uh, like playing with something doesn't need need to be fun all the time either. Yeah. Playing can be um, draining as well, or it can be um, explosive. It can be violent. You can play violently. I mean, people do it on a football field. I mean, people people thread pain, uh, playing and pain, or p- playing and suffering together. Every I know that when I exercise, I'm playing with suffering. It's strange, but that's what I'm doing. That's a, when there's that's music a, there, you guided through it, right? I mean, yeah. That, that's very interesting. I want to go back to this point before I forget. Um, you mentioned that when you were speaking about the grief side, that you were telling people that it was like I should have done this, or I should have done this, or it's my fault. I know that, and we briefly spoke, actually, I'll preface, preface this. I met you at a wedding and I asked you to go on the podcast and you said, and I thought this was so powerful and awesome. You go, I have uh, shit tons of failure. Uh, my wife committed suicide and you said it with a smile. And that smile doesn't mean you're happy with, um, with what's happened to your wife. It's a man that's gone through the ringer, willing to come out of the other end and pick happiness where he can, choose to live a fulfilled life and want to share his story. And it was just that like smile and how you said it where I knew not only is this going to be a great conversation that it is, but it's just someone that's willing to be open. And I thought that was beautiful. Well, I hope so, it was a warm smile and no, uh, no. not a cheeky smile. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know like, this man is sadistic. What have I got no, on my side? No, but, um, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's something I still, I still, uh, let's just say play with. You know, it's important to be able to play with the feelings somehow, somehow find a way to um, surf the wave of grief, I guess, you know. Um, so, and, and now I've got a new family, you know, and that's just, like, it's just so important to be able to to keep surfing <laughs> yeah. um, and keep learning and, and it's, I think it's a positive message for my older boy. Gabe, who went through all of this when he was 14, 15 years old, oh, right. and now he's 21, and, and he can lessen maybe, maybe is that life is quite long. It's not as short as you think. You do get a few lives within your life, maybe. Yeah. There's time. There's time. And there's certainly a lot to play with in the time that you hear. It's a really nice message. And in terms of from um, the forgiving yourself, because from what I hear and what you've said, that can be deliberating. And I'm sure potentially still go through it. But It's super okay. ongoing and it, it comes out in the strangest ways, the strangest, the strangest ways. Um, I, we all have a tendency to bend the truth, you know, occasionally. So recently something happened. All, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and recently I saw someone that I really didn't need to see. It had been a long time. And, uh, and we had a short interaction, but I exaggerated that interaction when I told the story back to someone. And, I've, and I actually... I didn't correct myself. I just went with this strange fiction and it was definitely related to how complicated those feelings are. Yeah. You know, I'm probably not making too much sense, but, but, but we do behave in, it can come out in many different ways, your guilt yeah. and feeling inadequate and, and, and it's hard to forgive yourself. Absolutely. Just and that's, why, that's, that's part of the work. Agreed. So, yeah, you know, we could talk about this for a very long time because you've done so much work on yourself. What, what are some of the things that you've done? Because we all deal with grief, every single human being, not only just being born, but grief throughout life. Have there been any things that have worked for you to like even just like correct yourself, to forgive yourself, to realize that you didn't force anyone to do anything? That makes sense? Well, firstly, I... I just want to correct you because I don't think I've done a lot of work necessarily. I think I'm, I'm lucky. I have a, I, I grew up in a beautiful family, great father and mother. They both had to deal with their own situations with their parents and they both inflicted whatever they did um, on me, but not <laughs> meaning to. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. just, they're just wonderful people. 
Nice. Um, and I've had to deal with it. But I, I have had I'm, – I'm lucky in that I've had really good role models um, when dealing with life. Um, my father taught me to meditate, introduced me to it when I was 11. It was ridiculous. We were living in France and he said, okay. And, and my brother and I were just puppy dogs. We would just fight all the time, very close in age, um, yep. and, but very different personalities. I was itchy. He was scratchy. <laughs> um, so, so I would just taunt him and he would react and it was just this ongoing thing. So my dad obviously thought that it would help. It didn't help at all. It just introduced <laughs> us to meditation. Um, yeah. well, I'm sure and I've had yeah. a, a very good relationship with meditation. I've, I don't think I'm very good at it, but I do it uh, twice or three times a week. I try and make it daily. It doesn't work out that way for me, but, um, but I, I feel the benefits um, and it just makes sense to me, the type of meditation I do, which is it's called Vipassana, which is more of a, a body scanning technique and a breathing technique. Yeah, I used to do it. In that. fact, it's, you've done it as yeah. well. Wonderful. So I've done a couple of retreats. Um, nice. These are 10-day silent retreats. Oh, you've done dad, 10 days? Yeah, holy I've done a couple of them and I've done a three-day workshop as well. That's gets me the most in life. There's we a lot of pain. There's yeah. Exactly. So th this is where you really learn about pain because yeah. you're sitting still and you're not talking to anyone and you've only got yourself. And I, th I think meditation is easily one of the most important things you can do for yourself. Mm. Certainly for me, be able to just sit there and look at what's going on. I, I honestly need to go back to the way I was doing it. I would love that because it did improve my life a lot. Um, and I'd recommend anyone to just do, for example, the 50-day Sam Harris course that he's got on his thing. You can even do it for, for free if you don't have the money to pay for it. He, he offers it. And it's just it's a fantastic introduction, 10 minutes a day. Um, definitely recommend it. But there's so many others out there, like whatever tickles you. I particularly liked his because, as I, as I suggest, it's very mechanical. It's very, just, it's very just here is how you lift a weight and, here, and, and this is how you do it so that you don't hurt yourself. Or this is, it's, it's caring, but it's not poetic. It is, it is just very functional. Yeah, gotcha. So that's the style I think I like in that because a lot of other things in my life tend to be quite poetic and... <laughs> and um, is towards dysfunctionality <laughs> with my creative kind yeah. of tendencies, you know. So um, that meditation has been a game changer for me. My life is completely different. You, when you also say like doing the work, not only therapy, but I feel like just by choosing to do music because potentially I know music is part of your DNA. Going through something like that, you might not feel like you want to play music, but even like going out a day and picking up a guitar or singing, that's also doing the work. Sometimes, and this is me, we associate doing the work as getting homework from a therapist. But it's yeah. not, that's not, like there's so many things we can do to feel on the uh, right track. It's even in a relationship, just, just pausing when you're in the middle of an intense conversation and pausing and breathing and shut up, just shut up, just tell yourself to just, sh just shut up. Take the third position. Don't worry about what you feel or what she feels. Just, just take a third position here. You're an outsider. Just be, that's the work as well. That is literally the work, being able to observe it. And listening is also important. I mean, I find it hard not getting distracted, you know, when I'm in the middle of a conversation. Sometimes when it's, you know, when it's, it's, um, it's intense or whatnot. So I... I think you can thread work through everything, but it never yeah. ends. It's not like yeah. you can do too much work or I work a lot. I've done it all. It's yeah. just like I, I actually can't stand it when someone says, I've done a lot of work on myself when it comes <laughs> to doing my grief and everything. Like, sure, of course, of course. And, and keep going. <laughs> you know, I don't think anyone needs an award for doing work on <laughs> yeah. on on anything it's just what we're here to do to keep pace with the universe or yeah. something and it's also nice to know that work doesn't need to look in a certain way and that we can all do it in different ways but mm. i really like that perspective and there's something it's also like important to speak your mind when you need to speak your mind yeah i mean but that's also yeah. in it as well yeah 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 that's like setting boundaries feeling good we need to voice up our concerns all of that i'm curious what you think about boundaries why do we have boundaries for you 
Oh, we put up boundaries. Um, don't have a poetic answer. Something I think about no. all the time. But you why know, do like you have bound- up- Why do you have boundaries? I don't have the answer either. I'm, it's just I'm just talking. Sometimes just- you set up boundaries to uh, for self worth. That's what springs to mind. Something I think about all the time. You know, when you think about something all the time, and then nothing springs to mind. Sometimes it's setting boundaries for you know a higher relationship, what you're worth. It, and w- what I mean by that is, let's just say someone's treating you in a certain way. For me, I'm signaling not only to the person, but to myself, I won't allow or will allow certain behaviors. I feel like once I put up strong boundaries, those reoccurring themes don't necessarily happen in my life. And I, I also feel like we've got lessons to learn in some mystical, magical way. And that's a way of like kind of addressing them for ourself or our psyche. What springs to mind for you? Maybe it's within the boundaries that we can do the work. You know, and if there's no boundaries, it's hard to progress or it's hard to move forward. So, for example, in songwriting, you can just go into a, a songwriting session with absolutely no boundaries. Yeah. It's a great idea, but within five minutes or any spark of creativity that comes on, it's already setting up boundaries because there's an idea that you're then working with. And that's just having an idea there that you're starting off creates a boundary. Oh, that is what we're focused on, not the rest of the universe. Yeah. You know, not the rest of stuff. But but I think they're just healthy. I mean, I think without boundaries, there is mania, and I've witnessed it. So so with without uh that's a good without some sort of order, there's there's chaos. I mean that's that's a beautiful thing about um about Jewish tradition, you know, that I love are the stories. The stories, they, they do create, the, the stories are there not to feel like you can do anything in the world and get away with it. The stories are there to teach you about the lessons are about boundaries maybe. That's a great perspective. You know, the desert, there was an end to the desert. It wasn't yeah. like this endless, you know, or, although maybe the desert does represent chaos and that this never ended, there's boundaryless. There are no walls in the desert, so you wander aimlessly through it you have no idea what's happening if there are no boundaries i'm riffing i'm bursting <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I love this and it goes i think this is how we're going to like figure out the uh the question as well that well you know when i say self-worth it's um putting those boundaries towards a framework to yourself to be able to live a better life or move forward in your life so without setting boundaries you talk about the chaos and it would be like a minefield how would you live your life it would be just absolute chaos as you said that's a really I'm going to be thinking about this for a long time, a very mm. unique mm. perspective, mm. but, you know, because we always talk about set boundaries, they're healthy, and it's true, but what else is it doing for us? And that's a question probably everyone will need to answer in their own way, but I know I that. I think the best parenting, because I'm a parent now, is one of them, like with boundaries, you're setting up boundaries for your children, and maybe rather than having lots of little rules, lots of little boundaries, so it's like, no, 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 it's very helicopter-esque, you know, maybe, <laughs> of course, when they're young and you want to keep them out of danger, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Just, in fact, you want to keep your kids out of danger. That's the prime um, motivation of parents is to keep your kids out of danger, keep them safe and loving and loved. But at some point you're going to have to put boundaries up, but maybe rather than having lots of little rules, you just have a few big rules, mm. you know, and they can so that they can work them. within, oh, well, they know that that's here. They know that there's the boundary but not lots of little places to knock their faces up against, you know, and then they don't know what is right or wrong because there's just so much wrong. Well, even just on the idea of wrong, I know this is kind of good. This is good too. I like the, I like the conversation about wrong as well. Right and wrong. Well, with right and wrong, that's something I'm not smart enough to have a, like a clear cut answer, but I learn from what feels wrong, what doesn't feel right. And so when let's just say I'm, it always comes back to this example. Accounting didn't feel right for me. Why doesn't it feel right? And then you go into a deep dive of all the emotions and all of that that comes out. And I learn from what's wrong. And so if I don't necessarily learn from what's right. Like I might, what feels right could lead into discussion around intuition and following your gut. But for me, when something feels wrong or I see something is wrong, that's where I learn. I learn from like inverted commas, my perceived wrongness. Does that make sense to you? It definitely makes sense. I often wonder whether there's that whether it's worth exploring the idea of right and wrong being related to good and evil. Yeah. Um, And 
there's when you're writing a song, and I keep on reflecting back to this because it's my source of... Well, yeah, yeah, brilliant, yeah. Being, um, it's very important that when you enter the circle of creation together or on your own, that you don't start with this right and wrong attitude. You know, nothing that you suggest in this safe area that we're writing in and trusting in and exploring in and listening in, that nothing that you suggest, whether unless it's obviously racist, sexist, whatever, the yeah. obvious kind of um, ethical kind of rules, that nothing that you suggest should be considered wrong because it's not, it's not, it's not evil. You know, don't, don't give yourself that, um, that um, heaviness, that guilt when you're writing a song. However, in the real world, you know, as we see every day, there is right and wrong. And yep. that's what I'm getting at is that, is that writing a song is not like life. It's not life. It's, yep. it's beyond that. You're playing. You're allowed to play. Whereas life is not just a game. You know, there, are, there is right and wrong. It's also like, I feel like maybe from a Jewish upbringing, I never thought of things as good and evil. I know that that exists, but as I'm going through learning about myself, we've all got, I call like a shadows wall. I didn't invent it. So a billion other people have invented a shadow side. And we all have a darkness within us. And I think that's actually very interesting because we're all capable of good and evil, bad and good but being aware of that, like dance, like we all have a bad thought, but we don't actually use it. Sometimes we want to hit someone, but we don't do it. And it's that relationship with it that I find really interesting. Well, it's the boundaries that are set up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we just go around killing anyway, them. it's yeah. very esoteric yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll have this uh, conversation another time we could do. Um, what, what was I going to say? Oh, to kind of like title up, we were talking about um, grief and all of that stuff. I would imagine you know, going through an experience like that, just to tie it up to maybe give some advice to people. How has it changed your worldview in a positive way? You couldn't you lose someone that's close to you and you go through a process. It's strange. There's, there's for me, because I'm open to the, to my senses a lot, is that I do sense her everywhere in a way. Nice. There, just And everything, my, I mean, I'm not just saying this, everything when it rains or when it's there and I do think about it and I, and I might even be imagining it, like I'm not saying that she is everywhere. But even if it's part of my imagination doing it, everything kind of glistens in a new kind of way. I love Nick Cave. He's an amazing, uh, he's an Australian artist. If you, if you don't know Nick Cave out there, you've got to listen to his music and get on the red hand files. He does this amazing, um, um, he does this amazing um, email, um, what's it called? Subscription, where people write in their questions and he answers their questions in the, the most incredible ways. And he had to deal with the death of his son, um, and then, and then just it's just so the way he dealt with it was imagining his son next to him before he went on stage. Every time he had this ritual where he would imagine his son there and he'd have a conversation with the son, and whether it was imagined or whether it was real, to him became irrelevant, you know, because it was the process of feeling close. Mm. Um, but you know the truth is, once they're gone, they're they are gone. Yes, I've also you have heard to deal with that. You have to deal with that, and you you have to find ways to do it. And sometimes there are there are questions that don't have answers, and that's that's part of the journey of of being able to accept it all. And it's I, hard. I know it drives me nuts at times, but you know we live in this world, and we don't have an answer for everything, as you said. But it sounds like you're able to dance around in the chaos and the magic of the world as well. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just a, uh, I wouldn't say a pet peeve, this is just an interest for me. How on earth have you done 10 day silent retreats? That scares me the most out of anything. 10 whole days, no electronics, you can't talk to anyone, you can't do anything. Please tell me what. 
how, why? Yeah, I mean, it might sound strange, but once you're at day one or two, day two, day three, the silence is beautiful because you're outside, there's trees, there's birds, you get really quite addicted. Well, you try not to get addicted because the whole purpose of being there is is to kind of detach from those, um, what the things that we are, you know, so addicted to in, in, in life, which is one of them is reacting and talking. <laughs> um, and you learn that quite quickly that it's the silence, you just don't get enough of it. So the silent bit is not a problem. If you need, need, need to talk to someone, there's teachers there if you need to talk to like, oh, my back is hurting so much, I don't know what to do. Because <laughs> that, that is actually, that's the hardest part is the pain, the physical pain, not the mental pain i found. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then the mind plays games obviously through the physical pain and everything. But you, you have these breakthroughs there where you will feel this incredible rush of energy through you. Yeah. Um, and that's, and you know that it's going to end. You know that in 10 days, and you do anticipate, you do think about going home a lot, um, but it's every just 10 day, days. Hour, I mean, yeah. I mean, well, probably every hour, yeah. I mean, a lot, I think they say that something like 30,000 thoughts a day that mm. we have on average. I don't know how they do that, but yeah. <laughs> Um, but 30,000 thoughts and then, and then all of a sudden you're alone with them and the thoughts inevitably because you're using this technique, it slows down, it all slows down, but they still flick in and out. It's, you get a theme of, cause I would imagine, or well, I've heard, I don't know how they get to that number, but I've also heard that as well. You would, I would imagine a lot of the thoughts are reoccurring as well. So when you're aware of a similar thought, even if it's presented in a thousand different ways, being able to catch it would be like a, a life changer mechanism in your brain mm. yeah to become aware of your thoughts and to be able to become aware of the person observing the thoughts yes because it's that's the next that's mastery that's another level you know yeah. you can actually observe you observing it all and and um and that's when you can start i guess relaxing away from your ego and your everyday um your everyday monkey mind yes that is very cool. I'm surprised, you know, you mentioned your family and how your dad taught you to meditate. I know that he took you to an ashram when you were 16 for music. You don't hear stories like that every day. Yeah, he had a love affair with, with India for sure, my dad. And he still goes back, I think, well, he hasn't been back in a few years now, but we've been trekking in the Himalayas. He took my brother and he also, this is real cool, he took my son when he turned 15, 16, I think. Oh, he took wow. him 16 to Varanasi and took him to the mountains. So. It's a family tradition. It's become a rite of passage. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, so there's a deep connection there. I, I studied Indian music for a while, and that definitely influenced the way I write, I would say, and the way I feel. I mean, yeah. How long were you there for? Two bouts. I was there for a few months yep. and then three weeks another time. So I'd love to go back. It's not like I've, I've spent half my life there. Friend of mine uh, oh, that's a long time. goes back there a lot, but it's a quite a while. It's a crazy place. Well, at 16, <clears throat> going to an ashram for, let's say, three months, that would not only change your worldview, but I would imagine, was music at the forefront of it your It was mind, completely maybe? music and a little bit of meditation. This was called the International Music Ashram, yep. and it was in uh, Varanasi, and <clears throat> it was gorgeous. We, we lived on houseboats, Dad and I, on the Ganges. Cool. And then every day I would walk... Um, and uh, to, to the school and I'd study at the school and, and uh, then they would have these incredible concerts there a couple of times a week. And by concerts, I mean, you're literally, you're sitting down and listening to, to Indian music, classical Indian music for three, four, five hours at a time. Sometimes wow. you're just completely enveloped in, in the culture and the, and the music. And yeah, it's something I'd love to be able to pass on. And my son went and studied there as well. And so did my brother and yeah. Is your son interested in music? Yeah, he plays beautiful piano. He's a composer, so he does, he does oh, a lot cool. of that. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. And um, I've got a, a thousand questions on this, so I would imagine, you know, that whole experience. Oh, no, actually, you studied film. So how was music the goal or was film? I studied the- music for film, but I studied in, at university I, I studied, I did an arts degree and majored in film, not yep. with music. I didn't do music in in, I did, I think, one year of music and just didn't like it. 
at a yeah. university. Is that because of the I way they taught it? I just didn't know whether music would be my thing and I wanted to explore other things. Maybe my parents influenced me. I can't remember, but I did languages. I was always really, really interested. Five in languages, languages I did, right? I did Spanish and, look, I don't speak five languages. I can sing in five languages, so I pretend. But I, speak, <laughs> I, speak French, I speak French quite well, so I speak French well. I, I lived in France for altogether about three years of my life and Sammy was French and my mum was a French teacher, so, so that's, um, I've, yeah. I love French music as well. I'm just... Very passionate see, about I can see how this all comes in. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there was Spanish. What I saw, Spanish. You can speak can, Hebrew. Uh, can you speak Hebrew? No, That's my Hebrew is crap. I mean, I can speak it a little bit. It's not. It's. It's. My brother is very strong at Hebrew. He's. My brother's a, a natural linguist. He can. He just speaks as soon as he hears it. Oh, I'm so jealous. Um, but I didn't go to a Jewish school, so I went to the local public school here in Sydney. Yeah. Um, and then went to Sydney High, so it was never a. A priority for me to speak Hebrew. My dad spoke it. Um, I wish I did now a lot better. And, I, and you know what? I spent a little time on Duolingo doing yeah. it. So I might head back there. It's oh, a beautiful nice. language. Beautiful yeah, language. agreed. And then, um, so what I find really interesting, we're going to skip a little bit. You, I want to go through a bit of a timeline because I think this is really unique. You end up doing that and graduating. And then I think you get a role, what's it called? You did music production for ads and you didn't like it. And you found out your wife was pregnant and you quit. I think you quit straight away. Can you tell me what was going on at that time? Yeah, yeah. So I was the like kind of like the laundry boy in a in a big music studio that were doing music was doing music for commercials straight out of film school. I did oh, music wow. for film in film school and then straight away I got a job straight away. Oh, nice. My friend was running a, a business doing music production for commercials. And I was I was just frustrated there. You know, I was, I can't remember how old, 21 or something, and, and I just wanted more out of music. And around that time, I re-engaged with um, my first music teacher, Eddie Bronson, or one of my first music who was otherwise known as Yehuda Bronson, who was this uh, Hasidic Russian accordion player oh, at the time. He was yeah. religious. And <clears throat> we got together and I remember singing a couple of, songs with him, him on the accordion, he says, you'll learn, if you learn 500 songs, you will be employed forever. Uh, and uh, I sat there basically with him over the next couple of years and learned a thousand songs, 2000 songs, I don't know what, and wow. Sam was pregnant and yeah, I quit my job um, and became a live musician. We started playing at Gertrude and Alice Bookshop down the road here. Um, <clears throat> we were doing it every Wednesday night, we'd have like a a queue of people wanting to come into the bookshop and and eat uh, eat soup and and dance. We were doing like tango and gypsy oh. swing and <laughs> and, um, and chanson and salsa and Brazilian music and and occasionally Hebrew music um, and and all those old standards. Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, just kind of I was crooning with like this bunch of local gypsy musos. Very cool. Cool. It's super cool, but also a lot of people, when they find out their wife's pregnant, they could panic, stay in the job because it's stable income or get what people would say a real job. I don't even know what that means, but you left and you took a gamble on yourself during something that could be perceived as quite scary financially. I think I, think I just would have had the support from Sam, from everyone around me saying, look, what are you doing? You know, and I was, uh, it was kind of like, I wasn't earning much where I was anyway. It wasn't like I was in the ad game completely, like thrown in, earning thousands um, a day for for doing commercial. I think, you know, while I was there, I probably, over the two years I was there, I probably did 10 commercials or something. It wasn't, it was, it was more being a studio hand, learning the ropes. Um, so all of a sudden you could, I could actually get work. And I think I was doing work on the weekends anyway, doing live stuff and, and we were pretty good at it. I mean, we started getting weddings or whatever and, and parties. And nice. then one night I was at a nightclub in King's Cross, which at the time was amazing. Yeah. King's Cross was just flourishing and full of... And booming, so many people. Booming. The drug, the drug trade was booming, let me tell you. So, <laughs> and, and, a lot, and, and obviously what comes with that, but there was a lot of um, action there. So one night I remember being up at a nightclub very early in the morning, 3 a.m., just come back from a gig, 
I should have been home, no doubt. But I jumped up on the microphone and started singing with a DJ who was there. Oh. And he told me that it would, might be a good idea to join him um, the, week, the, the next week in his studio to write some music. And over the next couple of weeks, three weeks, me, Dave and Johnny were in the studio and we wrote a few songs, got signed to a record deal and Don't Hold Back went number one on the dance charts for 27 weeks. Is it that crazy? You do not hear... You, you go from leaving your job, realizing that you probably, please correct me if I'm wrong, you wouldn't necessarily be happy doing a job like that. You take a risk to, you know, perform live music, which is inverted commas risky. And then you just, you know, you take a gamble and sing with the DJ who I assume you don't even, you might not even know or. You kind know. of knew. Yeah. Even, even so, like, you just got up and did your thing. And then a few weeks later, you uh, created the pot bellies. We're which... jumping up and down in a kitchen. See, it wasn't a studio at all. He'd set up, the, the, <laughs> he'd set up the, the dodgy little studio in the kitchen next to the fridge, yeah. you know. So, so, so in the original demos, I'm sure there's a fridge hum in there somewhere as well. And, um, look, they already <laughs> had a lot going on, the pot bellies. They were a DJ duo first. And they got signed because of their MySpace <laughs> was quite successful. That's, That's how long ago it was. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I came on as the writer and, and lead singer and, and it, it pumped. It's good. It was like a shotgun wedding. I, I, I often uh, equate it to um, that we just met one night in Las Vegas and got married by Elvis and then the rest is history. We, we were forced to live with each other for eight to ten years on the road. Um, because our just, very hungry manager just got us as many gigs. As hungry as manager. I love that. Is, what is your perspective on that? Because so many, you kind of, you made the one decision for you to like potentially live a better life. And then things are just working for you and flowing for you. Getting a, that, a song like that, 99% of like music, I don't know what the number is, musicians want that. And you meet this group, you're with them for, what do you say, eight to 10 years. What is your perspective on that? Because you don't hear a story like that every other day. I guess it's just do, do a lot. Do lots of things and, um, <laughs> and things happen. Yeah, I mean, no. But if just, you I can't explain how things are. I certainly don't, every day I don't feel like there's some external force at work um, I don't know whether uni- the universe conspires to help us. It'd be nice. Yeah. Um, but but there, there is certainly so much unexplained as to how things happen and why things happen. That is mm-hmm. no doubt. And, and I'm open to, to God and I'm open to, um, to there being uh, uh, levels of being um, and then one overarching arching, um, love field that, uh, that links us all. I'm open to that, sure. Yeah, same. But I feel like also regardless of all of that, you're just open to like it just seems like you're like, oh, this feels good or this sounds good. I'm going to put my hand up and do it. And that can be scary for a lot of people. You're like, eh, it can also okay. be very dangerous. <laughs> yes, we I, gave I, you the- I broke my heel doing that, jumping off the cliffs at, uh, at Tamarama. Just heel? Whim. Yeah, I landed straight on my heel on rock, yeah, from metres up. Yeah, I was lucky, very lucky. But, um, yeah, so that was going to be fun, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with this story. What, you know, you mentioned it was like a shotgun wedding because not only are you producing music with these two guys who also know each other, but in all relationships there's highs and lows. And sorry, highs and lows, but also like ha- how do you deal with people and collaborating with them, saying yes, saying no. And was that something that was a bit tricky for you? Because I don't know if you were in a band like that in that capacity at that stage. Oh, it was horrible at times. <laughs> it was just horrible at times. I mean, for the most part, I think that the job itself is not too difficult i mean the hardest part of it as i said for me was was coming back to reality and and being on the road and and getting up in the morning and getting on a plane i mean big deal it's a lot harder stuff to do and also you're singing your own music you're being rewarded you're getting everything on a platter you're being put up in beautiful hotel rooms you're getting served good food for the most part you're drinking to your heart's content you've got company everywhere you know so it's nothing to complain about but when things do derail 
you know, we're, we were also immature. We were in our early 30s at that stage. I guess it's a bit later than when it usually happens. Usually, like, rock um, success uh, or whatever you want to call it happens early 20s. Yeah. Um, you know, and because there's, I think, record labels are more bound to invest in something that's younger than something that's older because they've got more lifespan in them. In terms of, like, uh, touring and the energy levels? In terms of how much they can rinse out of it, yeah. Um, <laughs> but... You know, the the you know one of the members. Not not going into too many details, but you know there was there was substance abuse and there was just lots of never knowing what version of certain people you're going to get on the road, and that becomes hard and testing. And you know, like we we came from very different musical backgrounds as well. We've just started working again together actually after a few uh-huh. years, which is lovely. Yeah, pop bellies are back, and we're doing gigs here and there, and cool. so that's great. And I and we've all grown, and we've all we're all in in different spaces now than we were, I think. I'm ready. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exciting. I, I don't say it from like a gossip point of view. I say it from like even a, an accountant. When you're thrown into a new team and you've got different egos and different personalities, you might have your voice, how you want to do it. You mentioned different um, musical upbringings. That, and especially when it's a creative pursuit, that could be potentially a little bit frustrating because, you know, this might feel right, but you have to go a different direction to fit in with the rest of the team? I often felt like I was dealing with um, just musicians who weren't as good as me. So I got on my high horse often and would be like, we're ne- like I'd be kind of like, these, these guys were not trained musicians. They were DJ producers. And I, and I mean, now I can turn around and, and hopefully be a little more humble about it and just say, look, you know, I probably behaved quite egocentrically um, the time, you know, my wife and I, Sammy, we had a little project uh, going for a while, Freaks in Love, which you can check out on Spotify. It's a cute little project. But I, I did, was not into it as much as Sammy because I just thought that, you know, I should be doing stuff that was better than that for some reason. I look back now and just think how ridiculous, how absurd to think that one music is like working with, well, I, I, after working with a lot of, non-musicians i've realized just how beautiful it can be that's nice for them for you and and so that that's another regret i guess is not pushing freaks in love as hard as i could have not only for making her happy but because i would have learned a lot musically for sure i also heard i think it's i'm so glad that you bring up the egos like because we all do it in all areas of life but i'm shocked (laughs) <laughs> okay, <go ahead. laughs> but, but, no, not not shocking. I mean, I, I I guess that it's so ridiculous to think that you're at the center of the universe. I mean, it's a, it's actually when you look around you and you see the way the stars move and the earth moves and everything. Sure, your natural instinct is to go, we're the center of everything, man. We're the yeah. center of everything. But you, it, once you have children, you know, hopefully you start learning something else. You know that that Not everyone does. No, I, that's why I said hopefully. And there are times where I, I'm constantly slipping up with that sort of stuff. But I feel the I'm account- thinking of my own kind of viewpoint, or you know, think that something's right or wrong just for the sake of wanting to be right or wrong. <laughs> yeah, but you've you've got that uh, self awareness, and a lot of people would they'd sweep that under the rug. Even just having those conversations means for the next conversation you've got heightened a way that's I really essentially do. Yeah. Um, oh, I have, <laughs> Sorry, we, we're going round and round a windmill. And no, I, like- no, I, I um, oh, actually, I feel like you say that you have had a massive ego, which we all have, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that while the pot pillies was going on, on the weekends, I can see you smiling, you were um, still you were still doing um, like events and weddings and stuff. Michael, what can I say? You've done your research, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Always. On the, on the weekends um, while I was touring with the pop bands and now still I was coming back and doing weddings wherever I could. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I used to kind of feel silly doing them because it would be like I'm in this cool rock band electro outfit that's getting awards and, and getting success for our own music and then literally coming and being a wedding singer, like a wedding singer. What am I doing? Um, but then 
slowly I became aware of the fact that this is the most important part of someone's life and the most important day of someone's life. I mean, when you, I, I've, I made friends with uh, an incredible woman called Esther Perel, who is out here. She is the world's most prominent couples therapist. She comes here on tours. She sells, she's, she's a cult figure. She's amazing. And she came to one of my gigs once and then we became friends and we held a party with her while she was here. We became quite close. She took, well, I took her out to dinner and uh, I told her what I did. Other than that, she goes, Ilan, it is magnificent what you're doing. You're with people at their most important time. Now, people's most important time in life is the addition or subtraction of more or less people in their life. So when they get married, when there's a birth, when there's a divorce or a death, these are the most pivotal moments. And there I am as part of this incredibly pivotal moment in their life, creating the emotional journey of this day. And I absolutely love it. And you know what I'm really disappointed about is that there just aren't many wedding singers coming through that look at cultural, the cultural aspect. When I say cultural, I, I kind of mean Jewish, but also multi, like uh, French, Spanish, like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wedding singers that are coming through that can do top 40 and can, and can do it, but it's kind of, it's strange to turn around and think that I'm in my mid forties and I, I turn around and I just have no idea where they are. Who can I take under my wing? Who wants to learn this stuff? I mean, certainly in Sydney, there's no one in their 20s who's getting good at it. And it's a I, peculiar set of skills. It's tricky. It, it really is. And but it's the greatest job in the world. What can I say? Okay. Um, we've got a pigeonhole that. That's so awesome to hear. Um, but also, when I, I've seen you a few times, and I'm not saying this because we're live and I'm trying to be nice. I mean this. The way we've, we've gone to, I, I worked to like 10 or 12 weddings last year. And no one was bad, but no one was at the level that you were. And I'm not saying this to give you a big head. The way that you like read the crowd, channel the music, you could actually feel it. You could see this, like whatever, whatever it is, you could like feel this energy and you actually want to be there. And it wasn't like, oh, fuck, it's a Sunday. I got to do this. Maybe you still have those feelings, but when you're there, you were there and present and you were there to give a good time. I've never experienced anything like that. And I, I was like, wow, this is so cool. And, you know, you could have the ego based on what you're saying. The Potbelly is probably one of the biggest musical acts Australia's ever had. You could have the ego and be like, oh, I have to go to a wedding. But just what you said, and I know you're not lying, that you are there to celebrate someone's like most important, um, life, most important thing in someone's life. That is brilliant and it's rare. I think the key to it is generosity. And even though I, I, I do have like a, a, a great big lead singer ego um, in the... I'm very generous. I make it a thing to be very generous with my time, my energy, with um, the charities, with my friendships with people. Um, and that's, it's kind of like, I don't think it's something you can necessarily learn, but my parents too are very generous. People who I tend to surround myself with are generous with their time. So for example, the musicians that I work with now, um, you know, I'm just not interested in, in a musician who's just looking at their watch to see what time they're going or who's counting the dollars. I will take care of you. I will really take care of you. And I do. I take care of the guys I work with and they take care of me and it's, it's, it's the most important thing for me at work is to be with people that are generous. Okay. We're going to come back to that because I've got some exciting news for you. Um, I want are you to. Are getting married? Am I about to play at your wedding? Yeah. Or are you... <laughs> you are. <laughs> I was gonna. This... I was gonna tell you off air. I didn't want to. Yeah, you are. I'm very excited. Hey! <laughs> Why should I check in my calendar to see if it's there? Or no, it is. We okay. did. Yeah. But when I spoke to you, it was before, and I didn't want to bring up anything because I didn't yeah. want you to feel like oh, because yeah, at my wedding that we have to talk. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll do a meeting another time with you, girl. Yep, that's very exciting. Um, Happy to hear that. Yeah, so I'm like, I've been so excited. I've been wanting to tell you. Um, so how does it compare? Can you put into words when you're doing a massive tour and there's tens of thousands potentially as opposed to a smaller event or a wedding, is it a different feeling? Do you, how do you perceive them? Yeah, it's a different feeling, um, different energy, different mindset, 
Um, I don't get nervous for any of it. Interesting. Uh, very, very rarely. I mean, there are times where obviously when the pressure's there, like TV or whatever, uh, you know, you only get one go at these things. But And, and I also don't think that nerves are, are unhealthy in any way. And I know that I used to have them more than I do now. For experience uh, or a mindset shift? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I just realise, I just know that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's also how I feel about money now. Um, I know that I'll, just because of, you know, my family, like not that there's a huge inheritance or anything, but <laughs> I, I know that I'll never go hungry. You know, I know this and I, and I know and I'm just really lucky to be in this position um, in the whatever it is that we are in the top 1% of the world, 2% of the world of being uh, employable, uh, living in a good area, access to food, um, that I, I don't, I used to worry about money a lot when I was living in LA, I did. And I just, it just doesn't, look, if, if you struggle with money, I, I totally get it. And I'm not. Yeah, it's about your experience. It's about money. You have to. It's part of, you know, you want the best for your children. You want them to be safe. I just don't worry about it. Yeah, I think that's. I just don't don't right. stress about it. That's yeah. that's all I'm saying. But you don't need to even defend yourself. It's your life yeah. and your experience, and it's nice to see the shift of like you spoke about it, LA and the challenges there, and how you've changed your relationship with money, and it's obviously working for you. Mm. This is very empowering to hear. Mm. So yeah, I don't know how we got there. How did just rewind me? <laughs> we were, I've. We're talking about like small venues, the big venues, and um, the feelings around That's there. Right. So, I mean, I've I've done a dinner party for two, you know, and I've done uh, live on air to to millions as well over uh, on New Year's gigs or whatever we were talking about AFL grand finals, whatever. And it's still me. It's not like I changed me, but I I think that my physical gestures would be very different, obviously, if I'm performing for two. (laughs) They would become more theatricised if if it was a bigger. So definitely the physical thing and the the amount of stage, I would say that I probably exert myself just as much at a party that you've seen me at than I would at a huge Pop Bellies festival. In fact, in a way, because... I'm, I've got a telepathy with the musos that I play with and that we, we've been, we, we're so close. There's just something about knowing the instrument that I'm with and by the instrument I mean the band and my voice and everything together that it's so easy to surf. You know, like when you talk about a sport, when you, when you speak to a sportsman, are you nervous before you go out to the waves or, you know, to, to surf in a competition or whether it's, you know, going out, as a footballer, are you nervous? No, you're psyched. You can't wait to get out there and have a beer. Like that's why you're in it. You're mm-hmm. in it for the high. So, so it's a buzz. It's a buzz. It's just like I guess it's just like sport. I don't know when you're on stage, except yeah. you give it. You're giving yourself emotionally often, but not always. <laughs> Okay, that's very, very like cool. You're not going to be feeling the songs all the time yes. when you play live. You're going to be there singing them, but I don't know if you're necessarily going to feel every word you're singing the way you did when you wrote it. I, I don't mean, think that's possible. But come on. Yeah. I mean, just because you're singing a breakup song doesn't mean you're going through a breakup again on stage. But you can definitely look out there to the audience and see that there are some people who relate to it and are going through breakups. You know. So what do you do? Like if you're touring and you bang, 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 bang a different place all the time, was it, did you ever have to deal with demotivation? Um, Not with no, with the rest of the band sometimes. I mean, sure, I guess it, you know, it's pain in the ass to get on another flight. I used to replenish, I used to, you know, find a wave or go to a local yoga class. Here's a funny one for you. Out in the outskirts of Canberra once, um, and this is how I would be able to bounce back because you just asked how would I bounce back in the mornings or whatever, you know, and continue having that sort of energy. I... I looked up on my local yoga classes, Googled it, yeah. and it, there it said, advanced yoga, 7 a.m., really close to where I was staying. I was like, fantastic. I'll go and try this class out. I made it a thing to, because I went to so many different yoga classes all over the place and surfed so many different waves on tour. That was my thing. Nice. I used to get into this really great mode of, okay, 
the teacher is really going to be really good or really annoying one or the other so we've all been to yoga or some of us have been to yoga class sometimes you just get a really annoying teacher who won't stop talking i know uh all been there. or you'll get a really strong teacher who gives you the space that you need right so i made it a thing that i would go into these classes and i would sit there with 10 minutes to go before the beginning and close my eyes and meditate just sit there and perseverance do not open your eyes until the class starts because you'd just be surprised by what the teacher looked at like or whatever so here i am i go into this advanced yoga class in the middle of the suburbs of canberra i close my eyes okay class you can begin okay everyone in child's position so i open my eyes and i look around and i realize that it's not an advanced class it's an advanced age class <laughs> And it's just, it's just 70 to 85 year olds doing it. Anyway, I made some very good friends that day. That's so um, cute. And it was very cute. It was very cute. So that's a nice little story. Yeah, it is. About. And putting it aside just to kind of be there. That's great. So that's how I would get the energy back. I would, I would go for an early swim. The other guys would sleep off their hangover. I would punch it out. Nice. I like that. Before we do a rapid fire segment, I read, so you've gone um, solo in more recent years. But I read that you were a bit nervous going solo under your name. Can you tell me why? Well, it's a strange name. <laughs> Hard to remember, I think. I um, like it. But I've always, I guess, had a band, you know. And, oh, thank you, by the way. I'm happy that you like your name. I spent many, many years not liking my name. Now I love my name. I'm fine with it. Why is that? Is it a Jewish well, thing? Because or sound... most of my mates were like Andrew or Ben. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, and also no one knows how to pronounce my name when they first see it. They go, Ian, Elaine, <laughs> Ilan. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I get, I get that. But, um, no, I don't care now. I just want to put it out. So I've, I've actually done an album. I've got the last few sessions coming up, written all the songs. It's exciting. Oh, it's all done. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. We're just mixing and finishing off. So the thing is it was almost done about three months ago and then I wrote another four songs that I thought needed to go on there. So it's cool. You know, I'm working with a wonderful producer called Dan Na Nave, Nave in Sydney um, and, uh, and I've had all my friends on this album, so many of them. Um, so it's really exciting for me to, to put this out. It's called Chaos and the Nightingale and it's a reflection on my experience with, uh, with grief and, um, and the experience of trying to redefine what love is and, um, and the stories that go with it. And it's quite exciting too. It's not like a it's not a sad album. It's just a, it's, it just tries to, tries to reach um, quite far into areas that, that I think hopefully people enjoy. I think they will. And you released, you've released one, haven't you? Yeah, I've released a couple of songs. Yeah, oh, I heard the one the other day. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool, cool. When will it come? When will it all be out? Finished, and I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping mid, well, it'll be mid-year because there's a lot of planning. I'm discussing a distribution deal at the moment, which... It's a bit quiet, but yeah, it would be great. And you know, it's it's tricky this day. And we could this is a huge, completely different podcast. But you know, to to land the spaceship in in the music industry now is so tricky. And you know, people won't touch you unless your socials are absolutely through the roof. And you know, mine aren't amazing as they are. I don't mind getting on there occasionally, but it's not. I, I don't do it uh, religiously, so to speak. Um, but, you know, every, there's so many things that need to come together these days. Not only do you need to sing quite well, have a bit of a look, write your own music, um, make your own video clips. You've also got to be able to be a monster at writing, you know, little snippets and posting them every day. So, <laughs> I feel like you've got that though, like because you've written for so many top musicians along the way, I would feel like that would really work in your favour. Like you've worked with some enormous names and you can just get in a room and write. But yes, we will have to. But it's different with social media posting pictures and knowing what. Like, it's. I think it's different writing a song than writing a t-shirt. It's just a yeah. different kind of skill. Yeah. Totally. We we will have to because we could talk about this for many hours. Yes, I loved it. I, I really, I've really enjoyed myself, Michael. Thank you. We're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do like a the very quick rapid fire. I've also really liked this, so thank you very much. So, very quick rapid fire segment. The first thing that springs to mind. If you need time to think about it. Okay. Um, what's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Um, my guitar. Uh, favorite thing about yourself? Um, my enthusiasm. 
This what is are you? boring answers. Okay, go, no, go, no, go. No, no, there's no. I love right the right. ocean. I love the ocean. What are you most proud of? Uh, my children. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? The same as what I do now, I think. I'd just go for it. I'm not going to comment, but great. Uh, next big dream or goal? Oh, um, geez, that's, that's amazing. Um, I think... I think putting my new baby boy, Leo, through a great education. Nice. That would, that's a big goal. That's a really important goal. And for him to have an amazing life, you know, as long as being a, a great parent to my other kid too. Yeah. And a good partner and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why do you think don't, don't Hold Back was such a success? It was just timing. I think that we also had the support of TV at the time, which was very um, rare. Um, we just had some connections and they smashed it on TV really early on and it just caught on. You did a song for the Choice Foundation. Also, it's really catchy, annoyingly catchy. <laughs> I don't think you would say that. Uh, uh, we're going to have to plug that one. You can plug yeah. that one to get the... Yeah. <laughs> did a, you wrote a song for the Choice Foundation and that's kind of like blown up. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, Nothing Is Impossible was a, a COVID endeavour that I did while, whilst I was um, doing uh, those, those songwriting workshops online for uh, non-musicians. Um, and I was contacted by Taryn, who runs the organisation, and we sat down and th this was a song that did not take 45 minutes. This was a song that I really worked hard on and I wanted to be perfect in every way. Um, I was at the time listening to a lot of Coldplay, so you might hear a little bit of that threaded through. I like, like Coldplay. So yeah, quite like that. Yeah. But as a result, it does feel, it, it, there's a big, deep feeling through it. The message is that um, there are a lot of people behind the scenes that do the work that you don't see and that they are just as important, if not more important, than the ones that make themselves visible. Um, because let's face it, there are a lot more invisible people are, out there than there are visible, yep. and they're the ones that often um, keep the world turning and keep people happy and, and, and are helping. And when you found out it was going to be picked up for Channel 7 for the Special Olympics? Is it Special yeah. Olympics? Yeah. It was good. Uh, we ended up able to donate a bit of money towards it, and, you know, it was good. Because, I, I, I mean, I definitely did not do that song for... for um, any sort of financial gain whatsoever. Yeah. I, I never sit down and, and maybe never, it's a bit of a, of a stretch, but I rarely sit down and write a song for money. That's why I got out of ads, you know. I like that. Nothing and bad about it. I've got lots of my best mates do music for ads, do, you know, they write music for purely for money. Mozart did it, whatever, good. I Great. did not know that. Well, yeah, he would have been commissioned by a king here and there, I'm sure. Yeah, interesting. Uh, any advice you want to give to people who want to try something different or new, but perhaps a bit fearful of doing so? Yeah, that life's longer than you think. And that just start something and, and just dive in. Uh, I've got very close friends, older than me even, that started playing the guitar, age 50, and can now play guitar because they worked at it. It's all about volume, I think. It's all about how much work you put in. I started um, bouldering recently and I love it. So I'm doing a bit of that and, you know, cool. yeah. I mean, Anthony Bourdain took up jujitsu really late on and that was incredible for him. So there's no, you can just do it. You just, it's more your mind that's going to keep you from it. We've had Life is long. Just go, get in. We've had so many people hit success in their fifties or sixties on this podcast that blows my mind. Um, last question before I ask how people can follow you and keep up to date with you and listen to all of your stuff. What is the one question I should have asked you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh! I don't know. What's the one question that you could have asked me? I don't know. I guess we could have talked about um, a little more about the future, but what's the point? I mean, you know, yeah. About, yeah. About, about my daily thing. You could have asked me about my daily thing. Do I have a daily routine, I guess, in, in, in kind of um, support of the, the feeling of this whole conversation. So I, I'm down at the beach early. I try to be every morning to get a bit of space for me. Nice. Um, I have a coffee and then I'm ready to serve. Very cool. Um, before we go, how can people follow you? You're going to send me some links so they will be in the episode notes and all of that cool stuff. Yeah, great. I mean, everything I do is pretty much on the Insta. 
um, so they can just follow there. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to putting my album out. I'm about to do a Talking Heads retrospective in Sydney that sold out. Unfo- well, fortunately, it sold out, but there are no more tickets left. Um, so that's two not running over two nights with a great little club called um, Starfish Club. They do the first Monday of every month at Clavelli Surf Club, so a little local thing. So that's exciting. Um, but yeah, on the Instagram. And Amazing. So she- this was an absolute delight. You are remarkable. This was great. You've uh, positively challenged me and got me to think about things that I haven't thought about as well. So yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much, Michael. You too. You too. I love how Elan talks about surfing through his grief and how music has helped him with this process. It is admirable that he's used his grief to create a program where he could help others with their trauma through music and songwriting. A quality that I really admire about Ilan is that he's able to find the positivity despite the hardships. He exemplifies how powerful and important creative outlets are when dealing with our emotions, both the positive and the negative. Music has a way to transcend how we are feeling and often, if used correctly, can propel us forward. So I'll leave you with this epic quote. Music touches us emotionally where words alone can't. Johnny Depp. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 